There are several ways to define money. We're going to talk about two in this slide. M1 is defined to be the currency in the hands of the public plus checkable deposits. Currency held by the public is all the currency held outside of bank vaults. It includes coins in your kids' piggy banks, underneath your car seat, in your pockets, in, the in, in between the couch cushions, the cash in your wallet, or the coins and cash in businesses' petty cash drawers. Demand deposits is the total amount of money deposited in checking accounts. Traveler's checks are included in M1. They used to be very popular, not so much today. M2 is defined to be the sum of M1 plus the amount of money in savings accounts plus the money, amount of money in money market mutual funds. Money supply growth and inflation are very similar concepts. Money supply growth is the percent change in the stock of the money. Inflation is a percent change in the price level from one year to the other. Now, the reason why they're related is because if the Fed or our central bank starts printing money, it's flooding our economy with dollars. And the more dollars that are slushing around in the economy, the less valuable they are. So it takes more dollars to buy a Coca-Cola, for example. Now, this is kind of like if the Fed had, you know, a billion dollars worth of diamonds in its vault, and it just dumped out a bunch of diamonds in the U.S. economy. Well, what would happen to the price of diamonds if $5 billion of diamonds were dumped in the economy? Well, the price of diamonds would plummet. And that's the same thing with the value of money. So... When we have when the when the central bank is printing a lot of money, eventually there's going to be inflation. Now, how much inflation depends on how rapidly the money supply is growing. Hyperinflation is really 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 high inflation. Well, how high is really high? Well, most think it's about 50 percent. Um, it's a judgment call. And we usually talk about ridiculously high examples, um, examples like Zimbabwe. A couple of years ago, um, Zimbabwe was suffering from about 135 million percent inflation. Well, what does that mean? Well, if something costs you a dollar at the beginning of the year, the increase in the price of that item, that one dollar item, would be 135 million cents or 1.35 million dollars. So by the end of the year, that one dollar item at the end of the year would cost you 1 million 350,000 and one dollar. But that's an extreme example of hyperinflation. Now, compounding is very important to uh, remember when we're talking about inflation. Now, a lot of people don't think, say, 10% inflation is all that big of a deal. I mean, compared to 135 million percent inflation in Zimbabwe, 10% inflation seems rather uh, modest. However, because of compounding, it can be problematic rather quickly. For example, suppose you're currently buying something today that costs you $100. Well, if inflation remains at 10%, for seven years. It's constant at 10% for seven years. After the first year of 10% inflation, that $100 item that you like to buy every year will cost you $110 after just one year. After the second year, that $100 item would cost you $121. After the third year of 10% inflation, that $100 item is now $133.10. After the fourth year, the $100 item is now $146.41. After the fifth, it's $161.05. After the sixth year, it's $177.16. After the seventh year, 
that $100 item has nearly doubled in price to $194.87. So it's really important to understand the effects of inflation with respect to compounding. Things will double in price in just seven years with modest, what you would think is modest inflation of 10%. Now, examples of hyperinflation, I have two YouTube videos here. Um, the first one, you could uh, go to YouTube and do a search and you put quotes in the search box and type hyperinflation space dash space Germany space 1923 and then look for the the uh, video by P L Y M H I S T N E net. Okay. The second YouTube video can be found by typing in quote hyperinflation space Germany space 1923 and then select one by gold to the moon and these are really well put together YouTube videos that um, talk about hyperinflation a famous example of hyperinflation occurred in the Weimar Republic of uh, Germany post World War One now in February 1920 the Central Bank of Germany was printing this 10 mark. By 1922 they're printing 500 marks notes. By 1922 they're printing 50,000 mark notes. By 1923 a few months later they're producing 100,000 mark notes. Um, a few months later it was up to 10 million mark notes then 500 million mark notes. Now, this says 20 something mark, but I think what happened here is they had so many zeros on the currency that they had to kind of like erase some, some zeros. So, this represents more marks than that. Even This one says 500 million, this says 20 with a different word mark. So this represents a larger number than that, even though it doesn't seem like it. And that's what happens when uh, central banks <clears throat> have printed so many so many marks that they have to start erasing zeros from it. Now why did this happen? In November 1918 there were 29 billion 200 million paper marks in circulation. A year later there were this many paper marks in circulation and I have no idea what that number is. This was a massive increase in the money supply, an increase of, you know, 1.7 trillion percent. Now, when you're printing that kind of money, and you got the printing presses running nonstop, well, you're going to have hyperinflation, and they have some seriously hyperinflation. The money was so uh, worthless that um, it was common to see notes or bills in the street. I mean, when you walk around in America, you might see a penny or two on the street. But when you're walking around on a street in Germany, there, were, there was paper money everywhere because it's so worthless. It was so worthless that people were using it as wallpaper or they were burning stacks of cash. Yugoslavia had inflation problems as well, um, but it got really out of hand in 1993. Um, here's a common note that the Yugoslavian Central Bank was printing. Uh, a few months later, they're printing this one, and then they started printing this one, then they started printing that one, and then this one. Okay, so, you know, maybe you used that to buy a Coca-Cola at some point around 1993, and then about a year later, you're using that to buy a Coke. So, uh, things got really out of hand really quickly. In uh, January 1993, $1 could buy you 900 dinar. That same dollar bought you two million dinar in November of 1993. A couple weeks later, that same dollar bought you 13 million dinar. A couple weeks after that, 64 million dinar. A couple weeks after that, 6.4 billion dinar. So prices were doubling every day. Now, on the first or on the on the 24th of January in 1994, 
one dollar American could buy you that many dinar. That is a lot of dinar. Okay, so at the beginning of the year, one year earlier, if a Coca-Cola cost you a dollar in Yugoslavia, right? It would have cost you 900 dinar. If that same bottle of Coca-Cola was still worth a dollar American, you would need this many dinar to buy that same bottle of Coca-Cola. And that's why hyperinflation is associated with massive, massive money growth. Okay. Now, what role do banks play in the creation of the supply of money? Remember, we said that money supply is um, a function of bank activity and the Federal Reserve, which is the United States' central bank. Commercial banks bring savers and investors together. Banks use checking accounts and savings deposits to make loans. The balance sheet for a bank has two sides. One side has liabilities, the source of the funds for the bank, which include checking accounts, savings accounts. Now, assets generate income for banks, the interest payments. Those include mortgages, car loans, and U.S. Treasury bonds, and required reserves. Okay. And excess reserves as well. Now, I like, to, I like to think of excess reserves as big withdrawal insurance. If you have a lot of excess reserves on hand, and a guy like Jed Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies comes in and says, I don't like you anymore, I want my $24 million that I deposit in my bank account. Well, Jed Clampett, the reason why the Beverly Hillbillies is so funny is because Jed Clampett really didn't understand how banks work. Well, if Jed Clampett has uh, some of his $24 million in a checking account, well, Milburn Drysdale would have to have 10%. Uh, he could loan out as much as 90% by law, but he had to keep 10% in there. If he had a lot, if Jed Clampett had a lot of money in a savings account, well, then uh, Milburn Drysdale could lend out 99% because, you know, banks take the money in your savings account, your chain account, accounts, and they lend it out at higher interest rates. And the difference between the rate they pay you and the interest that they generate from making a loan is their profit. The net worth of the bank is the difference between assets and the liabilities. Now here we have a, 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 a T account for some bank. This bank has $300 or $300 million, however you want to think of it, in required reserves. The bank has 50 in excess reserves, so um, it could have made more loans in the amount of $50, but it chose not to. It has 900 in U.S. Treasury bonds and $2,000 in car loans for a total of $3,250. Now, on the liability side, it has $3,000 in deposits. And if these are in checking accounts, by law, this bank would have to hold $300 in reserve, which is why we have uh, why the bank over here has three hundred dollars in required reserves? Uh, that's a requirement by law. The net worth of the bank is two hundred fifty, and both sides add up to three thousand two hundred fifty. Now, reserves are assets not lent out by banks. Banks are required to hold a fraction of reserves. We denote this quantity R subscript R. These are required reserves. Reserves in excess of required reserves are called excess reserves, R subscript E. If the, reserve, if the reserve requirement ratio is 10%, the bank will hold $300 by law, required by law. They have to hold $300. The quantity of reserves is a total of required reserves and excess reserves. So in this case, the bank is not lending out 350. 